he walks and haunts to his soul. Lost, he takes shelter or orients himself with his little song as best he can. The song is like a rough sketch of the calming and stabilizing, calm and stable center in the heart of chaos. Perhaps the child skips as he sings, hastens or slows his pace, but the song itself is already a skip. It jumps from chaos to the beginnings of order in chaos and is in danger of breaking apart at any moment. There is always sonority in Ariadne's thread, or the song of all this. In the proposal for this paper, I promised to look at a number of different sites of de- and re territorialization within the musical work. In the process of preparing the text, I have judged the creative elements important enough to focus almost exclusively upon them, although my conclusion attempts to address questions of the autonomy of the musical work taking other sites, particularly the acts of performance, audition, and recall into account. I will address these at, on another occasion, either in print or in another paper. Before exploring the successive deterritorialization processes at work in music, and more specifically in the work I've selected as a case study, Brian Fernino's Carcere de Mercione 1, I will outline my analysis, uh, less an analysis as more my observations of and readings of. So it's my, my readings of Deleuze and Guattari's Eight Theorems of Deterritorialization, which are found in Il Plateau, split between two chapters, one on faciality and one on becoming. I'll deal with these theorems in four stages, slightly breaking the order in which they are presented in the original text. So you can see most of the first two there. So looking at the first three theorems, we're presented with two axes or directions of deterritorialization, horizontal and vertical. The horizontal axis is one of compl complementariness and the multiple. The vertical axis is characterized by overcoding, dominance, the politics of power, and the forced unity of our perception. We might call the forced imposition of the book and the end of writing. Taking in conjunction with the first and third theorems, the second seems to suggest that the, that the apparent speed or intensity of a deterritorialization and re-territorialization is actually what enables this reading, this vertical reading. The vertical axis is one in which tracings are made that are never returned to the map. And it is this axis which, historically at least, has dominated many aspects of how we think and talk about music, especially within academia. I take this as a provocation to refocus our thoughts to the horizontal axis and that of the multiple instead. Jumping ahead to the fifth and sixth theorems, the horizontal axis is opened up to become a plane in that each act of deterritorialization, which already occurs between at least two agencies, is made double and consists of two elements, major and minor, interlocked and intrinsically bound, least deterritorialized element provoking the deterritorialization of the most deterritorialized element. We can therefore imagine the plane of becoming as a rich geological scene with the vertical axis as a sampling rod inserted by an otherwise blind, Schro blind Schrodingerian prospector. This abstract machinery of deterritorialization and re-territorialization is not only constituted of a vertically perceived deterritorializing de force, but by all of the agents involved and complicit in the actions. Furthermore, while they identify the two elements of the double, while well, and Guattari identify the two elements of the double deterritorialization in the horizontal plane as expression and content, the two become indistinguishable by the process of deterritorialization. One could say through the process of the machine. Therefore, there is a process of perceptual flattening of the plane back to an axis. If the axis is then viewed from above, and the vertical overcoding element flattens the double axes. To to a single axis, we will find that the single axis can then be viewed from one end only, tending towards the spectre of the black hole on the white wall, a rich plane of becoming reduced to a simplistic smiley face. Finally, the eighth theorem establishes the idiosyncrasy of each process, leaving us able only to detect or measure specific intensities or speeds of deterritorialization, which actually lays open 
possibilities of interdisciplinary work, which itself could or should signify a wider practice of deterritorializing de within the academy, exposing the limitations that we ourselves put upon our own perspectives as we funnel ourselves into departments and into disciplines. Looking at the model, of, at this model here, of the critical <coughs> act, which I've, I've pinched from Jonathan Imbert's chapter on the psychology of composition, um, we can see a number of sites, moments, of deterritorializing de and re-territorializing happen. What makes the diagram even more fascinating is the potential that this diagram could actually be viewed rhizomatically, with the aspects of, say, the historical constraints that are in box E can be linked to what's happening um, with box H and to box F, so we're going from the conscious mind to the unconscious mind. Uh, the goals of box E could be linked up the, with, the, with the contents of box G, so that intentional goals are tied up with superordinate constraints. Quite aside from those logical connections, all of the boxes are interconnected, um, and this model does not really expose the extent to which an initial idea might arise from compositional devices, general stylistic knowledge constraints on form and direction, etc. In many ways, this model of composition is a vertical presentation of a number of the processes that occur in the act of creation, rather than a horizontal mapping of the, of the plane of becoming. But it usefully identifies a number of elements that contribute to both de- and re-territorialization. If we take the composer figure um, and the score as two distinct agents within the act of re-territorialization, we perceive one, the score, as more deterritorialized, and one, the composer, as the active re-territorializer. This misses the ways in which the machine also de- and re-territorializes the composer figure herself. Fernieho describes the act of composition as constructing himself through the work, and that he is who he is through having gone through the experience of writing the work. The score has two elements, one of which is more deterritorialized than the other. I would suggest that in this context, um, we could identify the variable elements that distinguish a work within our tradition, rhythms, pitches, expressive markings, etc., as the most deterritorialized. But there is also present the whole nature of the score as a score. This element is normally only slightly inflected by the process, but nonetheless, every act of composition is different and addresses the idea of what a score is and can be in a slightly different way, which itself comes back slightly different as a result. The conceptual identity of the score will vary from circumstance to circumstance, but by applying Judith Butler's model of gender performance, it is possible to propose ways in which the socially constructed idea of the functionality of the score is altered by every single performance of the composition of the score. The composer agent is comprised of at least two elements. I would suggest that, in this context, we could identify her image of herself as a composer and the various techniques and aesthetic ideas and ideologies are with the element that's most altered in the process of composition. But there are also other aspects of the personality which we assume remain untouched by composition, although I would suggest that every aspect of cognitive functioning is changed through the cognitive act on a continual basis. Moving on to Cartier La Mazione, the original title was The City of the Sun, which derives from an allegorical utopian text written by Tommaso Campanella in 1602. Viewed in this light, we can see a connection between this work and others inspired by astrological and alchemical writings, and construct a cluster of works that effectively establish an abstract machine that facilitates the becoming of the work. Although this original title, The City of the Sun, did not survive this process of becoming, elements resonate with the theme of this conference in that, among other things, the sevenfold spiral division of this allegorical theocratic city that, that Campanella describes bears a curious resemblance to the sevenfold vibrations of the Dogon egg that appears as an illustration within Mille Plateau. The architecture of the city was remade in the image of Piranesi's prisons within Rome, that Lois Fitch introduced in her pre presentation on Monday, um, as the imagery suggested by these engravings and by the extreme explorations of register in the Piccolo Solo Superscriptio, 
suggested a common core concern that would link the nine elements of this full Carcelli Lamentione cycle. As such, this cycle forms a pivotal role within Fernando's output, moving from the parametric deconstruction of the early scores, such as the Time and Motion trilogy of his works, an overt obscuration of the notation and intentions of these works, which I believe is implicitly tied into the obscurantism of astrological and alchemical concepts and texts, to a clearly gesturally based language um, that, again, Lewis was talking about on Monday, uh, defined via the lens of Deleuze's writings on Bacon. This style continues to dominate the works that follow on from this cycle, although one can perceive a further tectonic shift where the composer begins to work more intuitively in the informal recent works. As such, the Carcieri da Manzioni cycle forms a stylistic machine, as well as a machine of identity, and in the short term at least, reinflects our understanding of the whole oeuvre of the composer. But I want to add an additional layer of works to this diagram. In the Lemma Icon Epigram, although modelled on the 16th and 17th century emblema, was explored via Walter Benjamin's obsession with them. Superscriptio was very connected, very much connected to the earlier work. He describes it as a piece he wrote to cool off emotionally after completing it, and the idea of Benjamin's deck builder, the lemma of the title being the superscription above the picture of the icon. This connection allows us, or rather allows me, to add a number of works that derive from Benjamin and his ideas, leading to the opera Shadow Time in, in, in 1999 to 2004. Those ones are concealed below the bottom of that the screen. And Shadow Time is structured coincidentally in seven scenes, which reverse the spiral-like motion of the Dogon egg until the late listeners are encased in the egg of Benjamin's skull in the final scene as language and semiotics disintegrate, and effectively the world of the opera ends. The addition of this layer of works presents another connection which lies at the heart of how Campanella's theocratic city was reworked as Piranesi's prisons. Campanella wrote the city of the sun while imprisoned in Naples in 1602. Moved from prison, prison to prison, it is striking how he seems to have transformed the prison walls burying him into the city walls of the utopia he was creating and the very agencies who persecuted him throughout his life, Church of Rome and the Spanish monarchy, were the very agencies he celebrated and recreated through his writings. In this, Campanella becomes one of the series of figures that function as inspiration for Ferdinand, imprisoned yet constructing alternate great realities that mirrored the world they felt should exist. This includes the poet Ezra Pound, the Swiss schizophrenic Adolf Fulfley, and Benjamin himself, where the prison is more the situational dead end on the Spanish border than a physical prison. If we were to incorporate the various mythological figures that populate various Ferdinand works, such as Prometheus, Cassandra, and Sisyphus, um, Prometheus is, is bound um, in Tartarus with an eagle eating his liver every day. Cassandra is bound as a prisoner um, to the family of Achilles, I mean, not one of them, Achilles, I think. Um, Sisyphus is in, also in Tartarus, pushing a boulder up, up a hill forevermore. Um, so we have a larger cluster centering on the figure of the prison, for the prisoner. This prisoner is not always sympathetic and always, not always rational, but successive overwritings of this figure serve to deterritorialize its specificity, and what we are left with is a central, anonymized, and damaged figure creating utopian art. The imagery of this description evokes irresistibly those paintings by Bacon that we saw on Monday, especially those of the Screaming Pope, anonymized effectively so that all, remain, all that remains of the identity of the figure is just that it is a Pope and that it is screaming. As well as these conceptual de- and re-territorializings that seem to be playing out in this work or in my reading of it, there are a number of technical and historical, specifically connected to genre and compositional technique, deterritorializings in process. While I could tease out a number of these, I'm choosing to focus on just four today. The work carried out by, among others, Patzold, Toop, and Fitch in and amongst the composer's sketches illuminate a number of sites of deterritorialization already explored in detail by those authors. 
Repetition, exact and inexact, is enacted through the whole car sharing cycle in a number of different scales. Within car tree one, a uh, number of, um, and this is a quote from Lewis Fitch, an increase, increasingly lengthy tutti interventions interrupt into the main material. And this is, this is a fact in a fashion reminiscent of a written letter. The use and reuse of the limited repertoire of instrumental groupings, which are successively eroded and then reconstituted as audibly identifiable texture types, as well as the examples of blurring of successive bars uh, that again it's all Monday. They are all enactions and re territorializations of the figure of the refrain. The technical short term processes identified by Tuke in all three ensemble works entitled Calceria e Dominzione are descendants of the pragmatic strategies that the composer developed in response to the symptoms of narcolepsy, which triggered a loss of short term memory. Given the frequent complexity of layered processes at work within his scores, that a memory deficit would prove crippling if too much emphasis was placed on the purity of the process. Dirty and compromised process um, that recreates the intended surface become fundamental and ideologically rhizomatic. Calcerni Convenzione 1 was com commissioned by the London Sinfonietta for their existing lineup, and although the composer described some of the instruments he included in the score as weird, the instrumentation of the work bears the imprimatur of the history of the ensemble. This scenario is unusual for Ferdinand, with the notable exception of the string quartet, a medium which appears to provide endless fascination for him. And it is difficult not to suppose that his inclusion of weird instruments and other strategies, which I'll outline in a minute, represent a particularly energetic attempt to transform the territory of the historically located London Symphonietta. The abandonment of traditional instruments by three players who take up triangles towards the end of Cartier 1 will be revisited in the song cycle 18 Transcendental from within the same cycle, where the soprano takes the claves to signify the deconstruction of text to beyond the point at which some meaning can feasibly be reconstituted. It also echoes the use of percussion instruments by the singers in Time of Motion Study 3 of 1974 where it functions as a way to expose the auditory spectrum between the voice and the tool, which we could identify as the hand tool plane, adopting pseudo derrida terminology in order to incorporate a wider range of uses of these instruments in Ferdinand's output. Within the time of motion study cycle, this particular use of the instruments echoes the relationship of human agents with electroacoustic amplification and transformation, but it also identifies a connection with Stockhausen's contact in which the audible relationship between instrumental and electronically generated sounds is exploited. It could also be noted at this point that some of the registral strategies introduced by Ferdinand and Cartier 1 to illustrate the metaphorical extremes of the perspectives of Pyrenees' prisons echo the overriding shaping strategy of Stockhausen's Contrapunkt. Ferdinand as becoming child, the homo ludens identified by two, playing with different presentations of the refrain against the coming darkness of the dead end of dissolution. Ferdinho as becoming bird, bouncing off the planes and angles presented by the padded walls of Wolfley's prison. Ferdinho as becoming music, surrendering his fixed identity to the abstract machine as it rewrites him. Music is continually engaged in a process of becoming a tracing. From the meta work imagined by the composer, to its inscription into the score, and here, I'm very much alive to the multiple forms that a score can take, not all of them physical in nature. To its commitment to the vibrating air through performance, to the decoding of this air by the human brain in the act of listening, and to the recontextualization and re-performance of the act of remembrance. The map of the musical work only exists in the process of its extinction into an incomplete and inexact tracing. In order to reconstitute this map, a new performance, actual or virtual, must be made. Although the temporal nature of music ensures that perception of his work as a whole and as a map will be impossible, since to successfully plot cartographical points using this map, one must depend upon the tracings in our memories. Irresistibly, one is drawn to identify the musical work not with any of the tracings proposed by other ontologies, or with a larger conception conceptual construction made up of these tracings as outlined by, for example, Lydia Gerr, but instead with the abstract machine identified by Deleuze and Qatari, comprising not just the individual agencies diagnosed in this paper, 
but also the processes of de- and re-territorialization necessary in its action. The, uh, the tendency of musicologists to fetishize these artifacts of tracing leads to the overemphasis of the importance of the score or of the act of performance and ignores the wider picture that the study of as many aspects of the machine as a possible presents. Through the presentation of these ideas today, and I believe this is echoed by a number of presentations we've seen over the last two days, three days rather, I think that we can propose a practice of aesthetics that attempts to provoke, attack, and potentially dismantle existing academic arguments that construct institutional fixity of thought and formalize the academy in whatever form. That this language echoes that of Peter Berger's theory of the avant-garde is not accidental. And it is to be hoped that those of us inspired and engaged by the writings of, among others, Deleuze and Gabi, will continue to dismantle the institution of academia so that we can prepare the way for those who will come after us. Thank you.